good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me okay in the back? Perfect, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful Tuesday evening in September. I can't believe we're already in September. We have one more lecture left in the 2023 lecture series. Um, I also have a couple of other exciting event updates. So October 7th is our Oktoberfest. Tickets are on sale right now, so I hope you're all going to join us for some um, German tradition and um, um, interesting programs that we have going on on the site. And we also added a, another author talk. Um, so this is not part of our lecture series, but Cynthia Kierna published a new book called The Tory's Wife, A Woman and Her Family in Revolutionary America. And this was just published this month. So um, we are one of the first locations where Cynthia is going to present her book, and I hope you can join us. It's October 24th here at the museum. It starts at 7 o'clock, not at 6, like our typical lecture series. But please come out. Book it, uh, the books will be on sale, and you can purchase them, and then Cynthia is going to be happy and sign them as well. Um, and then one more lecture is going to follow that in November. Samantha Seely will talk on November 14th about race removal and the right to remain, migration and the making of the United States. Uh, so I hope you all are going to join us for these in exciting events that we have lined up for you. And without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Larsen. Um, he will talk about Alexander Spotswood's Germana a gateway to colonial Virginia's West. Dr. Larson brings more than 30 years of archaeological experience to his position with the Germana Foundation. Um, it's historic Germana now, right? Yes. Yes, they just renamed themselves. Um, he has worked with the National Park Service at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park and for the University of Maryland on sites in Annapolis, Maryland. He directed field work at the Freedmen's and Contraband Cemetery for the city of Alexandria in Virginia. He has taught introductory archaeology classes and trained numerous students through a variety of field schools around the mid-Atlantic states. Dr. Larson has been with the Germana Foundation, Historic Germana, for eight years, during which time the Germana Archaeological Project was born. And um, my colleagues, some of my colleagues and I had the great privilege of visiting Historic Germana um, er, later, earlier this summer. And if you haven't been there, I can highly recommend it. They're doing some incredible work. They have several open days throughout the year. So if you're interested in early American history, they're doing some excellent work there. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Lars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the invitation to come and um, speak about something that I've grown very passionate about over the last eight years. Um, I will admit when I was hired by then called the Germana Foundation, um, I really didn't know much about Germana. Uh, it's not on any maps, in Virginia maps. Uh, so it was hard to sort of learn about it, but I went and learned about it. And the more I, I read, the more I dove into the archives and the records and the genealogies that are available, uh, the more interesting stories popped out. So tonight is an opportunity to share some of those with you and also to talk a little bit about the shape of Virginia's history um, in a time period that often gets overlooked or forgotten about or skipped over. Uh, we often go right from Jamestown to the Revolution. Uh, in, in this case, we're going to talk a little bit about Virginia finding its way and in, 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 uh, growing in the, in the second century, uh, beginning in the beginnings of the, the 1700s in the 18th century. Um, just as a little bit of background, the Germana Foundation, now Historic Germana, was originally called the Memorial Foundation of the Germana Colonies in Virginia Incorporated. It's a kind of a mouthful. So we did, they did shorten it down to the Germana Foundation. We are located right next door to the Germana Community College, and we often find, times find ourselves answering questions about, you know, can I change my classes or my schedule? which we cannot help them with. Um, so we decided maybe we should sort of distinguish ourselves a little bit. So we're, we've tried out historic Germana because that's really what our focus is, is on, is on his, historic sites, but also on the descendant and genealogies of, of the descendant people who were connected with the little community that was once on maps uh, and is now forgotten. We're working on seeing if we can bring it back to the maps. So we'll see, but this is a little bit of our story. It goes back to the 1950s is when the, the, the foundation had its beginnings. 
Um, and there's one of the early picnics with a lot of the descendants community who are really sort of the, the, the beginnings and bones of this, this organization that we now, we now serve as, as Historic Germana. Just to get a little idea about where we're located, we're about halfway between uh, Fredericksburg and Culpeper. I think I can get pointers. So there's Fredericksburg there, Culpeper. This is the Rapidan River or the, the lower fork of the Rappahannock River. And we're located right along a horseshoe bend in that, in that river. Uh, that's the location where historic Germana once sat. So let's talk about who the players are that we're going we're to speak about tonight. Uh, of course, there's an indigenous population that has been part, long, thousands of years, been part of, of this riverfront area uh, in the Piedmont of Virginia. Um, so that's an important player. We also have the English colonists who began, you know, settlements in Jamestown in 1607 um, and began expanding the colony into the Virginia colony that we, we come to now know as, as the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia. In this case, we also have a group of uh, German speakers. Now, they're not from Germany per se, because Germany isn't formed yet, but they're part of the areas that would become Germany. Uh, we, we often try to refer to them as these German speakers who immigrated to North America. And then lastly, we also need to talk about enslaved Africans that were brought, or forcefully brought, migrated to uh, North America. Go into those a little bit in more detail. Um, we have here sort of a division of native groups by, by language groups. And you can see running down the middle in the bright orange is a group of, of a Siouan language family group, which include the Monahoac and the Monacan. Monacans are recognized today. Tudelo, Saponi, and Okanichi as well. Um, those are all sort of a, a common, similar language group, family group um, of peoples that we need to sort of begin to understand. And, and notice that they're located sort of here in the, in the central portion, that strip of Virginia, the Piedmont. They're, they're the peoples that predominated the Piedmont of Virginia uh, during the 18th century. Here's another map, but this one is a little bit different. This one takes away sort of our, our current political boundaries. Um, and you see a little bit more about where these Siouan speakers really, really lived. And that goes all the way from the, the, you know, the northern portion of Virginia and West Virginia all the way down into the Carolinas on the, on the end there. We, we need to sort of consider there being some sort of affinity amongst all of these peoples. Um, when John Smith came and was going up to Chesapeake and, and stopping at each of the mouths of the rivers and starting to go up the rivers, he made his way up the Rappahannock to the point where the, where the fall line was, where he couldn't bring his boats up any further. And he asked about what's farther up. And he was told that that's where the Monahoac people lived. And he was told several towns that were associated with the Monahoac. He didn't have any contact with them. He didn't go up any further. Um, so, but today, we still sort of identify the area where Germana is located as associated with the Monahoac people. However, the Monahoac people aren't someone that we recognize today. And at the time when, when English began to move into that area, the Monahoac people had, had uh, moved. Doesn't mean that they were gone, that they were extinct or anything like that, but they had simply, because of their own political um, situations, had moved. Largely because from the north, the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, up as far as New York, the, you know, the, the five tribes that were up there, were expanding their territories, working on gathering more, more furs for the fur trade. They were actually moving southward and causing, causing strife within this area, which may have been a, you know, something that made the people that were called the Manahoac at the moment that John Smith came um, and asked about them, to make them sort of retreat, move in with others to the south, um, and then essentially leave that space open because it was rather contested space during that particular moment. So the indigenous population is part of this story. It is, it is not something, sometimes, you know, when I first got there, we didn't know much about them as part of Germana's story. We're now working on seeing what can we learn? What, what can we really sort of look at this? What are the politics that are going on at this moment of settlement um, that are part of this story and really part of what's happened at, at Germana? So they're an important player in our, in our stories. Um, here's an example of a, of a modern day sort of recreation of a Monacan village. This one's the one over at National, uh, Natural Bridge State Park. 
um, gives you just a little bit of sense of what you know a, a village maybe looked like in the in the 1600s and the beginning maybe around 1700 itself. All right, we also need to talk about the English. Um, the the talking about sort of the tidewater area and the early English settlement. Of course, we have Jamestown marked here. Um, up in Maryland, St. Mary City is marked here. Again, you can see it's very close to the coastline of the Chesapeake. Along in the area, you see several forts that are, are listed. These tend to be right about where the, where the fall line is, where the, where the water moves quickly and through, through a, a heavy drop off that boats aren't easily able to navigate any further north. So they created the fort system to sort of use that to protect the, the boundaries of, of Virginia's, of the colonial settlement. Um, also with that, I kind of find it useful to use this very, uh, I don't know, I remember this being in my American history textbooks. You know, this is a very common, common uh, p painting, um, and it escapes you right now of whose house this is, but it's, you know, it's sort of known, but it's in a folk style. But what's important about it is just sort of the way that the, the landscape is formed. Of course, you know, in, in English thought, the head of the, head of the is the, the main house with supporting buildings around it, you know, that, that create the, you know, the, the, the support system that's needed, also the labor to be able to use the land, cultivate the land. Uh, I love the way that there's grapes growing right, right there. That's kind of fascinating. Um, there, there's not tobacco in this one, but tobacco was what was really chosen. And then most importantly is the access to the river. And here you've got a ship essentially, you know, setting in front of that. So in a way you have this, this idyllic landscape of, of a, a pyramid with access to a, a river system. That river system then would pro, you know, provide you access to the, the Chesapeake Bay, and then onward out into the Atlantic Ocean, and then onward back to England, but also to the entire Atlantic world. This was, a, this was the, the transportation system for a global economy that was forming during this time period. And this particular idea of English settlement fit well within that global ideal. All right. Um, imagine, if you will, now I, I, we mentioned already that I, I did some teaching for the University of Maryland. Sometimes there was lecture halls with 75 students. Um, I had to try to figure out ways to keep them from falling asleep, I understand completely. So I would tend to, to sort of play with the animations to kind of keep things moving along. So you know, bear with me, you know, this is just a way of sort of rehashing a little bit about what we've talked about. Imagine what we have here is a cross section of Virginia with the mountains here the Piedmont in this area, and then the coastal plain next to either the bay or the ocean, whichever you'd like to choose. So when we tell about our typical settlement system, you have the, you know, the settlement there at Jamestown, build our nice houses. Over the, the next decades, they discovered ah, one way that we can actually make this a successful venture is through the planting of tobacco. So they started planting up the, 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 the coastal zone as much as they could. Again, with the ships being able to move up and down that area and able to transport goods <coughs> back across the ocean, transport tobacco across the ocean, and then goods and ultimately also people uh, back to, to the colony at that point. So that's sort of the model that, that we have going on at this point. Again, what important little things here are the fall line. The fall line is that barrier which boats can't go any further. They can't proceed any up rivers from that point on. And then way off in the distance, beyond the reach of that first 100 years of settlement was the Blue Ridge Mountains. All right. Next, I want to introduce the man who's part of our, the title of my talk tonight is Alexander Spotswood. Now, Alexander Spotswood, I, I'll try to, I've got a lot of slides and I apologize. I don't, I don't want to keep you here all night. Um, so I, I'll just briefly give you sort of a biography of him. Alexander Spotswood was born in 1676 in Tangiers, uh, Al Morocco, excuse me, Tangiers, Morocco. He was the son of an army surgeon who was serving in that space. In 18, or 1683, his mother moved him to Eng back to England, to London. He went to school and, and, and finished things up. He was not ever a gentleman, you know, in, in the sense of being a landed gentry, um, but he was, he was well off. By age 17, he joined and got a, an ensign's position for himself, moved up through the ranks, was, was commissioned as an officer, and over the period of his career, uh, made his way to lieutenant colonel in the, in the British Army. 
He was the quartermaster general for, um, for the Duke of Marlborough at the time of the Battle of Blenheim. Now, I didn't know exactly what that meant until I sort of did some research. Quartermaster was really a, a, logist, a logistician in, a, in, in the biggest sense that you can think of. Every time the army moved, when they needed a campsite, Spotswood was part of that decision. The, to enable to move all those horses and, and men, you also needed to be able to feed them. So he was also sort of the person who was responsible for the log logistics of getting food to them and food for the animals. In addition, he was also in charge of uh, the, the transportation routes, and that includes the bridges. So in essence, he was kind of in charge of the engineers that also needed to make sure that the, that the, um, the armies got to where they were going. So this was a pretty high profile position that Alexander Spotswood found himself in under Duke of Marlborough and the success in the Battle of Blenheim. He distinguished himself um, in the rest of his career. He was actually at one point when he was working on one of the bridges, um, a, a cannonball uh, hit, hit one of the bridges and part of the bridge actually landed and crushed his shoulder. Uh, it is said that he recovered the cannonball and kept that with him for the rest of his life and used it as a conversation piece. We would love to find that cannonball someday, but you know, we'll, we'll see. He, this was an, he had an interesting career, but he found himself not being able to sort of advance any further. What he was able to do was he was able to find that, that uh, profile that he gained during, during working under um, the Duke of Marlborough to get a, a position in one of the colonial government systems. He was not appointed governor of Virginia, he was appointed lieutenant governor. The governor of Virginia, Lord, Lord Orkney, uh, George, I think it was George Hamilton, um, never ever left his home in, in, in England or in Britain. Um, but he shared the position and Spotswood went in his stead. So Spotswood is actually the representative of the crown uh, on, on, the, on the ground here in, in the colony of Virginia. Uh, lieutenant governor. So, you know, I apologize. Oftentimes we just go ahead and call him governor, but, you know, officially he's the lieutenant governor of the, of the colony of Virginia. Still a lot of power. He was the, the voice of the crown here in the colonies. All right. One of Spotswood's concerns, being a military man, was the, the, the defense and stability of the colony. So he came up with a scheme for defending it. Uh, part of it is in Williamsburg today, they're actually working on, archaeologists are working on looking at the powder magazine uh, on, the, on the main greenway there. Um, that was built in 1715. That was a way of sort of storing munitions and arms for the defense of the colony. Well, that was, that was part of Spotswood's belief. He also came up with the idea of, of two new forts. So let's review a little bit. There's Jamestown there, and there's Williamsburg, the new capital, when he moved when he moved to Virginia in 1710, when he arrived here in Virginia, Williamsburg was a new, new capital at that point. Um, in fact, he kind of helped shape its look a bit, uh, which, we'll, which we'll talk about. But Williamsburg is there. The bulk of settlement focused around the James and the York Rivers. And again, it's always below the area below the fall line. So that's essentially where most of the English colonists were living at the time. What he conceived was he said, well, what's the next river system to the north, which is the Rappahannock, and then a river system to the south, which I believe is the Manhattan River, uh, but starts in the Carolinas but moves into there. And he sets up two forts beyond the fall line of these, of these rivers, one to the north and then one to the south. The one to the south he calls Fort Christiana. Uh, it was originally written as two words, but been sort of compressed now to Christiana today. Um, that he conceived as being a sort of a, a trade zone for uh, the, the, the treated Indians at the time. Um, many, of, of many of the different tribes and, and polit pol political organizations of the time actually moved and set up uh, small villages next to Christiana. Um, and it actually became quite an enterprise of trade. Um, it kind of got, him, got Spotswood noticed and in trouble with some of the council members and Burgesses who were already here, who lived along the James River and already kind of had set up some of their own trade systems. Spotswood's new monopoly, as they called it, was just not something they could live with. And so those, those bodies, the Burgesses and the council, decided to, to stop funding on Fort Christiana soon after it had gotten, 
gotten established. To the north, he created a second fort, Fort Germana. The idea was initially that a war had broken out in 1711, the Tuscarora War on the border of Carolina. The Tuscarora had sort of up, risen up against the Car Carolinians who were moving rather fast and, and sort of usurping a lot of territories and stepping on toes. Um, Spotswood said, hey, we, we really can't live with this at our, at our you know, on our bounds. Um, and so he went and treated with those Tuscarora that, that were living also in Virginia, the northern portion of that group. And he, he asked them, he said, tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you a reservation area between the um, Rappahannock Rivers and the, and the York Rivers. That could all be the, a Tuscarora reservation. And that would see, be bounded close by by Fort Germana, what would be called later Fort Germana. That was his initial idea. The Tuscarora, though, just basically said, no, no, we're not interested in that. They moved north and joined the Haudenosaunee, the, the Iroquois Confederacy in the north. So Spotswood has his fort, but he doesn't have really sort of a, the justification that he, that, he, that he initially had set out with. That same moment when all of these things are happening, he gets word from a gentleman he had spoken to briefly um, that he, would, he was sending a group of German um, immigrants, German-speaking immigrants, to Spotswood. Uh, and Spotswood had to figure out then what he was going to do with them. They had talked, they had a brief conversation earlier about the, the possibilities of developing a mining industry, of, of mining iron ore. Uh, and so Spotswood knew that that was, what was the, the, the juxt of the conversation. Um, but he still just surprised had to figure out what am I going to do with this group of, of immigrants that are coming in. He puts it together. Why don't I put them inside this fort? We will designate them as rangers so that they won't be subject to the, the normal tithe. Um, he, in, he would sort of vouch for them saying, look, I have all these German Protestants. He was very clear about making sure that he told everybody they were the Protestants. And I'm going to settle them in, in the fort and they will serve as a buffer. There still was a problem in that he was concerned about the French and, and, um, and um, indigenous natives who, who were influenced by the French coming in towards from the West and, and causing problems for Virginia. But then there was a third thing that he considered that, that the Germans might also be a good buffer for. Any escaping enslaved individuals who were moving West to try and create a maroon community of their own would be cited and, and also sort of a, the Germans would serve as a buffer for that movement as well. So that was sort of the reason why Fort Germana came about. Now, many people have sort of suggested Fort Christana had much more sort of a military um, setup to it. It was a five-sided fort and each of the corners had a bastion. Spotswood provided each bastion corner with an artillery piece so that it was a much more militarized system set up there. It was never attacked or anything like that, but they were just sort of better established. And inside of that fort, he had colonial rangers, soldiers, uh, who, who lived and occupied the fort. It wasn't true with Germana. Germana had a, a fort with, with palisaded walls, but what they kind of talked about most was a sort of a central blockhouse, uh, a, a protective defensive structure. They didn't have but two guns, he provided him two guns, and he kind of just said, well, that'll, that'll make enough noise that'll scare anybody who's moving around in the distance. Um, so there wasn't sort of the same military setup for Germana, and so people have often asked, well, you know, Germana really was just kind of a boondoggle. It really wasn't for anything. I kind of suggest to you, I learned, I learned this from his Civil War historians, actually, uh, that there is a really valid reason to put a fort where, where this was located. To the west, you have the Blue Ridge Mountains a natural barrier. To the east, you have the significant channel of the Potomac River. That creates a constriction in Virginia that's only 40 miles wide. That in, in, the, in the Piedmont, some of the Piedmont is hundreds of miles wide when you go farther south, but the Piedmont here is only that 40 mile uh, distance. Germana sits right at the center of that 40 miles. So any movements of peoples, uh, natives, anybody moving north and south would probably kind of come in contact with, with that fort. That fort is sort of centrally located to be in a very strategic point. 
It's also along the Rappahannock River, which is just another natural east-west transportation route. So kind of think of Germana as sitting in a big X, north-south and east-west. Germana is, is very opportunistically located. And our friend Alexander Spots with Lieutenant Governor actually himself rode out and chose this spot, just like he did with Fort Christana. He also chose the, the Germana Fort location as well. And there is, a, there is a solid reason to have a fort there. It was, it was sound thinking on his part. All right, so let me go back to my, my animations again. So now we've got you know, settlements in, in, in Jamestown, but also the entire tidewater starting to fill up. There's still that barrier with the fall line. We have Alexander Spotswood himself making a journey, finding a proper spot along the Piedmont, and then setting up a fort. That's essentially what his idea was, is starting to move Virginia westward. And the first buildings that you need to put up are, are defensive structures like a fort. That's our symbolic foothold, toehold for uh, movement westward. You, you had a question there. It depends on it depends on where you are, but it, it, what it is is it's just a physical barrier for ships. Shipping can't go any further, you know, beyond those fall lines. Yeah. No more than 100 feet. As far as vertical drop, yeah, but you, you got a lot of distance and you got a lot of rocks and rapids and difficulty managing through that. It, it's a it's a significant barrier, and that's that's what I'm emphasizing is is that you know that's that's the the. The constriction on, on moving any farther west. If you're relying upon your rivers for transportation, you can't get any farther up those rivers with any significant boats at that point. All right, our third player is the Germans. And I briefly mentioned that Spots would, you know, receive word that these immigrants were coming his way. They predominantly came from an area on the western edge of, of today, Germany. Um, this is an area that had been fought over and, and occupied, changed hands numerous times over 100, 100 years. Um, at this point in time, I don't, I'm not sure I fully understand it exactly, but a lot of people living in the Palatinate area were ready to leave their, their farms and, and emigrate at that moment. They would have to ask permission to, to be able to leave. Then they would make their way up the Rhine. They were invited by Queen Anne. Um, they were made to feel welcome by Queen Anne, and then so many made their way to London, lived on the outskirts of London. Some of them rather destitute, you know, Germ the Lond Londoners were sort of concerned about the poor Palatinates who were living on the edges of their, of their you know, of city. Um, this particular group then sort of, as many did, most of the Palatinate uh, migration at this period made their way to New York and to Pennsylvania. This small group made their way to Virginia. Uh, after getting, you know, permissions through this this sort of back back room discussion that Spotswood had with uh, Christoph de Graffenried, they made their way across the ocean. And these are names of particulars, and I, I kind of got a sense from some of you that maybe you have a connection with the German descendants. These are the names of the the 1714 colonists, the group that came in 1714. So this is the first group of Germans that were brought by Spotswood. Uh, and, and settled at the fort. We have Albrechts, Brombachs, Kuntz, Fischbach, he Hager, Hyde, Hoffman, Holzclaw, Kemper, Martin, Otterbach, Rector, Spielman, and Weavers. It, it's amazing sometimes, I can't, you know, I, I, I kind of don't believe that it's going to happen, but there's been many times that I've gone out speaking and I put these up and then somebody kind of says, oh, I, you know, I think I, so I, I, I can't skip this over. I kind of have to put this in here. Um, if you are finding yourself interested in this, the, the, the descendant group that created the, the Historic Germana Foundation um, have done a, a remarkable bunch of genealogy that, that's available um, to you if you're, if you're so interested in sort of seeing if you're connected with this group. I, I can highly recommend to you that as a resource. Um, I'm not the best to speak about it because my interest is in archaeology. I'm, I'm more interested in what's under the ground. They're more interested into what happened to these families and then a second group of families that came and, and how they man made their way in, uh, in an American experience that, that brings us to today. All right, let's talk a little bit about life at the fort. Um, this is from the Journal of John Fontaine. He, he visited the fort in 1715. 
Um, and he gives us really our best description. There's no drawings of it. This is a, a drawing made from this description. Uh, the drawing was made by a Germana descendant in, in um, the 1950s. Um, but it's a representation of you know, what you can kind of imagine. This, this description, though, is rather interesting. You know, he describes nine families, and they have nine houses built in a line. Before every house, about 20 feet from the house, they have small sheds built for their hogs and hens so that the hog styes and houses make a street. He talks about it being the shape of a pentagon, and in the center of the pentagon is a blockhouse. And then I think this is rather interesting because you know he's, he's largely just doing a physical description, but he actually talks about community. They make use of the blockhouse for divine services. They go to prayers constantly once a day, two sermons on Sunday. Just a couple short paragraphs, but it gives a, quite a, a, an insight into this particular uh, settlement. Let's call it a settlement, Fort Settlement. Uh, imagine, if you will, it's just a small village that's enclosed by a wall, a walled village, probably much like the villages that they came from. Um, maybe it was very different from what they experienced in, in Germany. I imagine it was very different, but maybe in some ways there were some similarities. I don't know. This is what we're hoping to learn. We're actually trying to do archaeology at the site and learn a little bit more about this fort, fort period of occupation. Um, we still have a lot to learn. I, no spoilers. I, 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 we, haven't, we haven't discovered all there is to discover yet. Um, but this, this sort of gives us a little bit of insight about what it is we're looking for. Um, I asked a VCU art student to kind of sort of help us reimagine, since we only just had that one drawing that was done by a, a descendant. I asked her about creating another drawing based on that documentation. And what I love about hers is that she actually occupied it. She filled it with people and activity. And so these are just some of the examples, some highlights of, of the drawing that she did for us. Um, again, which kind of gives us an idea about this is a living space. In addition to being a fort, it's also a space where people's homes and everyday lives were, where they did laundry, where they took care of animals, where they went and worked. Um, the work that initially started the conversation was about you know, starting an iron industry in Virginia. Um, Spotswood, it, it's a little hard to know what's going on. Spotswood didn't have absolute permission that he could do this, but I think he set, about, set them about doing this anyway. Um, what they were looking for is not deep pits of iron or what they're looking for is surface bog iron, which is, which is you know, fairly, fairly accessible and, and, and also present. There's a lot of iron in, this, in the soils around in Virginia. Uh, er, any area that has sort of been inundated and then dries out again, can cause con concretions of that iron that can be available in a, in a form of bog iron, bog, uh, bog ore, um, that could be you know, surface mined and then utilized it later. And that was really what the intent was. And it's believed that, that these Germans um, did get a start on that. When, that when, they, when they finished, when they picked up and moved away, though, Spotswood ha didn't really have an iron industry yet. All right, our, our last one that I wanted to talk about is um, the enslaved and forced migration and the enslaved trade. Um, the Virginia Piedmont was a place where when it started to be um, de occupied, um, the, the, at the amount of enslaved individuals rose at that time, sort of concurrently. So as the Piedmont was being expanded, settlement was being expanded into the Piedmont, the numbers of enslaved population were also rising in that beginnings of the 18th century. Um, recall, recall that this is a different journey. Um, this is not a journey, you know, across Atlantic, you know, that it, it, on a ship. This is the middle passage that we're talking about, cramped, cramped quarters where one is treated like a commodity. Um, you know, this is a very different migratory experience than, than the Germans had or the English had. Um, we don't know as much about the enslaved population there at, that lived in the, in the community of Germana, um, but we do have a little bit, and we have hopes of sort of developing a relationship with that descendant community. So in that light, we know that when Alexander Spotswood died in 1740, associated with his household at Germana were an individual named Kaiser, Billy, Jillian, Jack, Dahl, Marianne, Rose, Eleanor, Sharper, Jenny, 
Bella, Queen, Katina, Lucy, Maul, Ellis, and Molly. Um, we don't know much more about these individuals. Through the archaeology that we're doing, though, we're starting to see their presence as part of the, the everyday activities that are going on as part of this community. And so we want to try to acknowledge that. Interestingly, Katina, we know a little bit more about Katina. She gets mentioned in a lawsuit um, that occurred in the 17, uh, 1720s. Um, she was noted as being a, a, an indigenous woman enslaved by, by Alexander Spotswood. Um, she, got, she was not part of, of the, 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 um, the court case except that she was a witness, uh, uh, you know, mentioned in, in the uh, testimonies that came about. Um, so again, we learned a little bit about her. Plus, we now realize that in addition to enslaved Africans, there's also enslaved indigenous people who are living and working within the household of Alexander Spotswood. Um, interesting and, and something that we, we want to pursue more. We now sort of have to consider that in recovering artifacts that are part of that household, we need to consider that part of that household was an indigenous presence as well. All right, all that's to say is colonial Virginia at the start of the 18th century was a place, I'm gonna call it, of cultural entanglement. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of intertwining of peoples and stories that are taking place in this environment. People are living very closely. People are relying on each other. People are taking advantage of each other. There's a lot going on in this particular space. It's not just about Alexander Spotswood. It's about peoples. All right. With that said, we're also going to talk a little bit about sort of this Alexander Spotswood in influence. So Fort Germana, we want to talk about as a jumping off point for Lieutenant Governor Alexander Spotswood's Knights of the Golden Horseshoe Expedition. This took place in 1716. It just, I like to ask sometimes, do, have people, do you know about the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe? Is it, is it fairly common? It may be because you sort of live on the, on the, um, the western reaches of, of Virginia. Perhaps you hear about it. Um, I never learned about it, but I, my formative years were in the Midwest. So, you know, it kind of makes sense that I didn't hear about it. I don't remember my kids who grew up here in Virginia. I don't remember them sort of learning about it. It was always like Jamestown and the American Revolution. They didn't talk about this in between very much. So I'm just always curious. This is just something I didn't know anything about. Um, but there's a lot of interesting story to go along with it. So, Alexander Spotswood has set up this fort system. I told you about some of his concerns about the French. Um, this is a map that was they believe it was done sort of, you know, working sort of, it's a little bit of propaganda for Alexander Spotswood. This is a map that was created in probably around 1715. Um, Germana is actually located on the map, which is unusual because there wasn't much of Germana at that point. It was only that small 300 foot per side palisade area with nine houses in it at the time. Nevertheless, it makes it on this grand map of Virginia, Carolinas, Maryland, and New Jersey. Uh, note also up here in the upper corner, it says Erie, Erie Lake. There wasn't a great understanding at this particular moment about where the, they knew that the Great Lakes were there and they knew what they looked like, but there wasn't an understanding about what their relationship was. Um, Spotswood was of the belief that he knew that the Blue Ridge was to the, to the west, and over the Blue Ridge, he thought once he got over that, you could probably easily see Lake Erie nearby. And this map sort of reflects that. The important thing about Lake Erie is, is the Great Lakes were controlled by French. So that means the French are close. Spotswood is very concerned about that natural barrier of the Blue Ridge Mountains, that the English need to gain control of that Blue Ridge before the French do, because that's a barrier that's gonna allow one side or the other to, to control space around them. So Spotswood conceived of this idea. He learns that previous ex expeditioners, uh, out, outback specialists had gone and found a passage over the Blue Ridge. Um, he decides that he wants to put together an expedition and sort of prove this for himself and also to lay claim to the Blue Ridge before the French get there. 
So he comes up with this idea and, and they decide to use Germana as a jumping off point. So I like to talk about five days in August of 1716 as sort of a microcosm for this world of cultural entanglements that I just talked about. So imagine you're the German family, you've lived in the, at the fort for almost two years, um, probably mainly speak German. There may be some other individuals around who don't speak German, but probably every day you speak, speak in German. There's probably not a lot of people around you. There's probably just a lot of work to be able to keep your daily life, washing clothes, cooking food, those sorts of things, um, uh, keeping the house up and make, maintaining fence lines, all those sorts of things that are sort of necessary for, for survival. Um, you probably kind of got down to a pretty much of a routine. Well, imagine, and I like to, to let people, I like to sort of guide you a little bit to think about Think of yourself as like a small boy or a small girl. You choose which one you'd like. One of those children that were there, because there were families that went and were living there. Imagine yourself as one of those children, and out of the woods one day, you see several bewigged gentlemen show up. There's about 14 of them, of gentlemen who are sort of listed as part of the expedition. But they weren't alone. Along with them came servants, some of them enslaved Africans, some of them indentured servants, probably different languages being spoken, but nonetheless, a bunch of, of servant class that went along with the gentlemen who were on the expedition. But that wasn't it. Then also two companies of rangers came out. So these are essentially colonial soldiers. A company is six men and an officer. So that's about 14 individuals that come out of the woods. And I, and I kind of imagine that they're demeanor and their, their language was a little bit different than the gentlemen who were, you know, who were wearing the wigs. And then lastly, come out of the woods, are four Menheran guides. And all of them meet and convene at, at your settlement, in your little palisaded village. It more than doubles the population in a short period of time. They all meet and converge there for five days. The goal is to, you know, to, there probably wasn't space to set them all up, so they probably set up their tents, and the goal was to shoe horses for the expedition. Apparently, in the tidewater, there's no rocks, so you don't need to put shoes on your horses. Now, you all here in the mountains sort of know that, well, horses, you know, can't, can't live like that every day, so they knew that as well, so they used those five days as preparation to, to shoe horses for this expedition. Um, and there's an example of, this one's not found at, at, uh, at our site, but at Ferry Farm nearby in Fredericksburg. Uh, but that's a, that's a horseshoe from the, the same time period, or relative, around the same time period. Um, again, with all this activity going on, campfires around, cooking going on, different languages being spoken, imagine again, you, I, I asked you to imagine yourself as a child there. What do you think just happened? How would you interpret what just happened? Would that be a scary circumstance with all these different peoples coming out of the woods and, and different smells and languages and sights and activities? Would that be a scary moment or would it be just like the circus came to town? I, I imagine you could probably go either way on that. You know, there, there's, but, but that moment, those five days are a period of, um, of interaction amongst all those different players that we talked about initially. So again, I like to sort of emphasize those five days are a bit of a microcosm for the story of Virginia's westward expansion at that moment and also sort of a, a, that colonial frontier backwoods experience. Um, it's, it's a life in proximity. It's a life where one has to sort of get used to another, uh, different than yourself. Um, that's, that's the experience. Um, it's not all about you know, rough and tough wrestling bears and things like that. It's also about learning to live with people who aren't, aren't what you think or what you're used to, different cultures, all those sorts of things. On August 29th, 1716, the expedition departs Germana, heads west. And we talked about this a little bit. Somebody was asking about what, what we think the, the, the route was. Uh, it's really believed that... Um, Oh, I'm drawing it. Swift, Swift Run Gap is the most likely crossing that, that the Spotswoods Party expedition made. Um, there's a marker there outside of the, the park marking that. Um, people, there are people who sort of argue that there are different routes. I think that the bulk of people who really study this, have studied this, sort of think that the Swift Run sort of makes sense compared to the, the diary entries that were made along the way. 
there's just an example. They made their way over the mountains, crossed the river, crossed the Shenandoah um, into the valley where, where you know, we now experience things today. Uh, they wasn't much talk about it, but I, I, apparently they probably saw the next the rest of the Appalachian Mountains that were in the way. I don't think they talked about the Erie Lake, you know, showing up in this, but they celebrated nonetheless. Um, Spotswood, he had gravers along, and he was supposed to, like, you know, going to carve you know, a message into the stone, but he found it too hard, so he wrote out a message and he put it in a bottle and they buried it. I guess that's the way to claim land. Um, then they proceeded to essentially have a good time. They had, they had toasts. It, it's remarkable. When they start to list all the toasts, they toasted the king, they toasted the governor, they to toasted the lieutenant governor, they toasted about everyone you can imagine. Interestingly, at, with each toast, they would also fire a volley. And every time they would change toast, they would actually change their beverage as well. It's, it's kind of remarkable because the list is long. You, you kind of imagine they must have had at least a couple pack animals, horses just loaded down with liquor and, and alcohol. It, it makes you wonder about you know, the expedition, if that's what they were bringing along um, for this expedition into the, into the wilderness. Uh, it seems like uh, these gentlemen were prepared. I'll just leave it at that. What happens when they come back? They make their way back. It's a successful venture. Nobody gets hurt, injured. They get up bumps and scrapes and bruises, and somebody, somebody comes down and has to turn back sick, but everybody makes it safe and sound. What largely happens when they return is that Spotswood himself, he's the best example, he begins to acquire land in the Piedmont for himself, and the other gentlemen do as well. This is the beginnings of you know, land grants that are taking place include the Piedmont. Spotswood himself acquires eight, accumulates 80,000 acres that really run from the base of the Blue Ridge all the way down to uh, the, the Rappahannock navigable areas in Massaponics. So he actually kind of, his land covers the whole stretch of that 40 miles of, uh, of Piedmont that we were talking about earlier. And right at the center of that is Germana. So he chooses Germana as, a, as, a, sort of, as, as sort of the center of his land operations. And he builds himself a house there. Now, I neglected to talk about, while well, Spotswood was governor in, in Williamsburg, he was the person who oversaw the completion of the governor's palace. And many, believe, you know, many talk about his influence over the governor's palace. Many blamed him and accused him of cost overruns uh, for the governor's palace. He finishes up around 1720, 1721. Um, people kind of consider it a boondoggle and, and really kind of lambasted for it. But at the same time, many of the Virginia planters start building houses that reflect many of the ar architectural designs of the governor's palace, the Georgian style of architecture, that sort of thing. Um, Spotswood is ousted for the governor's his position in 1722. But he's already got this land acquired, you know, out in the, on the, in the Piedmont, including Germana. He already sort of has ideas for this house that he's going to build of his own. Imagine, if you will, that he builds almost a second governor's palace for himself at this little community called Germana, where the, where the German settlers once had been, were first settled. This is just a, we don't, this house no longer exists. It's nothing but ruins. Archaeologically, it was studied by um, state archaeologists, but also the University of Mary Washington uh, for about a 10-year period. They, we've learned a bit about the house, but everything we know about it is from the ruins. A colleague of mine, Mark Trickett, Dr. Mark Trickett, actually kind of has set up a little bit of a, a 3D model based on the plan views that we've created through archaeology. And this is just sort of a visual representation of sort of the, the scale of the house. We're, we're going to work on it and see if we can make it a little bit better based on what archaeological materials we have. But it's a, it's a representation a little bit about what spots would build for himself out on the edge of settlement, on the edge of, you know, in the, in the back country. All right, get back to my little story again. There we are, we were back in 1714 with the fort being built. Spotswood and his expedition make their way over the Blue Ridge Mountains, cross the Shenandoah. Yeah! Celebration ensues. They turn around and make their way back. And what does the Spotswood decide to do? But he decides to sort of settle in, in as British a way as possible to start creating estates 
for himself, but also for his friends who went with him in the Piedmont at that point. Spotswood's mansion there claimed to be known as the Enchanted Castle. I don't think he called it that himself. I think people who didn't like him sort of said, oh, that's Spotswood's Enchanted Castle, sort of tongue in cheek, making fun of it. Um, but that's what we know it as today. But that was begun around 1720. All right, so think, think about this world of living in a fort. Everything was sort of a wooden world. And so that's kind of what I have examples of here. Hewn, hewn wood. There's both broad axe and adze down here. Down there is the, the, the 14th century engraving of, of drilling done by hand with augers. And there's some, almost mid, these are medieval tools, uh, but those would have been sort of the tools that would have been very useful in that fort world. Spots would change that all of a sudden. In 1720, when he starts to build, he, he wants to build out of brick, which involves brick molds, drying those bricks, stacking them up, and firing those bricks. Those are all done on site for, for his house. And there there's, must be 100,000s of bricks that, that were needed to build this house. He also used a quiet sandstone. A quiet sandstone is the source of sandstone that they used to build the, the Capitol building. Um, he's very early adopter of it. In fact, his land actually you know, included some of the uh, uh, quarries for quiet sandstone. And there's an example archeologically of some of the ornamentation that was, came from the Enchanted Castle. And you can see, you know, it, it's the detail of, of wood, woodwork, uh, wood, wood um, trim work, but done out of sandstone. That's, that's, that's not the wood world that we were talking about before. And then lastly, recovered at the site back in the 1980s was a fireback. This one today uh, is at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in, in Richmond. Uh, but it was recovered from Spotswood's home. A uh, very elaborate cast fireback. It's believed that this was cast in the furnace that Spotswood, after the Germans had sort of left, he was able to begin a, 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 an iron industry centered out of his sort of home in, in Germana. The furnace itself was about 13 miles east of Germ Germana, so it wasn't directly part of our, the property where, where Germana sat, but it was part of this larger holdings that Spotswood had created for himself in the 1720s. And, and again, craftsmanship being introduced to that, that out, uh, the, the frontier world, essentially. Uh, just some examples archaeologically of, of what we see of the Enchanted Castle. It may not look like much, but I'm hoping to convince you that it is rather exciting. Um, this was dug back in the, in the 80s and 90s. This is, a, this is an exit out of the basement. This is a, a, a set of stairs here that led down to an arched tunnel way that went out probably to a cistern nearby. So it was a way of accessing water without actually leaving the house. Um, again, you can see sort of the specialization, the craftsmanship that's involved to create something like this. This is not your typical yeoman, yeoman farmer's house. Ourselves, in the project we've been working on in the last eight years, um, we found the, the front walkway to the Enchanted Castle, and that's it here. There's a course of, of guard bricks sort of marking the edge of it, and then there's the herringbone pattern bricks that are set beautifully even today as we uncovered them. And then there's a large sandstone here. Um, note, this is essentially, you know, this stone is kind of located here. But note, you can kind of see the tool marks still in that sandstone block that's right there. Again, this, this is sort of marking the craftsmanship that's involved. However, uh, while we're talking about a grand home, also think about the three, the three you know, examples that we have here. The tunnel in the basement of the house, that was not the space that Alexander Spotswood used himself. This was a workspace. The front walkway probably was not used by Alexander Spotswood as well. The front walkway went along the walk-in area to the, the basement work areas of the house. These areas, as elaborate as they are and sort of as representative of, of fancy architecture that they all, they also represent the lives of enslaved and servants who worked at Spotswood's household. The things that we find associated with these spaces are part of those lives as well. And we're trying to tease that apart in our archeology span right now. Uh, that's part of the story of the Enchanted Castle as well. It's not just about Spotswood. 
it's about that larger community. You can't have a craft world, a craft-led world without people to, to do that labor, without the skills, without the hands, without the muscle and sinew, sweat, blood, to, to do all that work. So that's part of the consideration that we're, we're taking as we're looking at this grand house. Uh, here again is sort of an example. The archeologists first kind of came up with a, a drawing, a map on the ground of where they found the ruins of the house. Uh, Carrie Burreal, Dr. Carrie Burreal, did her dissertation on the house and she created sort of a, a front representation of what we believe the house may look like. And then I told you about Dr. Mark Trickett and his creating a 3D rendering now. I, I kind of like this photo because it, it represents about three decades of technology and archeology, span moving from a 2D maps to sort of a, a, a again, a two-dimensional, but a representation of a, of a space to now sort of three-dimensional modeling that we're trying to use uh, in a way to be able to, to share our findings with, with people. All right. The time. The Germans didn't stay. I'm, I'm going to try and go through quick. The Germans didn't stay. They were indentured to Spotswood for four years, the first group. And at the end of the four years, they said, thank you very much. They picked up, asked for the lands that, that they were owed to do at the end of their service. They picked up and went to those lands. And it's interesting because those lands reach just outside of Spotswood's land holdings. So the Germanic, first Germanic colonists made their way to a place they called Germantown. And they divided up their space into sort of equal plots of land. Um, there's a map here sort of showing sort of they did that. There's a little creek, Licking Run, that runs through the center of it. Everybody was set up with property that had access to Licking Run. In a way, this is a very German model of, of laying out the world for themselves. Um, it's very different probably than what they were experiencing when they were living in the fort, a world that was not of their creation. But those immigrants brought with them ideas of how they wanted to live together as a community, as a German-speaking community, and that's reflective in their moving to Germantown. The second group, Spotswood liked having Germans there so much that he actually invited a second group. They weren't from Siegen, they weren't from the same exact area, and they weren't miners necessarily, they didn't have connection to mining skills. They were more farmers and craftspeople. Um, they couldn't live in the fort because there was no more room, so they lived around, settled around the area, kind of creating a newer, bigger Germana. They were indentured to, to Spotswood for seven years, and they did the same thing. When they reached the end of their time, um, they picked up and said, thank you very much, we want to go. Spotswood wasn't very pleased about it. He actually sued some of them, trying to get more labor out of them. He lost that suit, and, and um, they went on their way. And they made their way to Madison County, and sort of around the Robinson, Robinson River area. Uh, Hebrew and Lutheran churches is, is something that they built. There's many things that are, come in that area that are sort of reflective of that group of, of Germans. Uh, but Hebrew church is one institution that that's, sticks very closely sort of with that group today. Um, and that, that, that was sort of that group's Lutheran church that they established for themselves once they got the opportunity. All right. As this was happening, Spots was losing labor. He actually makes a choice that many Virginians do, uh, or gentry do. He replaces that labor with an enslaved labor. So Germana doesn't disappear. It doesn't just, just go away because the Germans picked up and left. It still continues to grow and thrive. Here is an overhead view of our site. The red outline here, that's the outline of where we believe the footprint of the Enchanted Castle once sat. There's a whole wooded area to the west of that that we're beginning to explore. And you know, here's an example. We found a lot of <coughs> stone rubble that we believe is part of the masonry structure. Um, it's unusual. Most houses being built at this time in, in you know, the 1720s, 1730s wouldn't have been made with masonry structure like this. So we're exploring it further. Here you can see the, the wall fall actually looks to take a little bit more shape and form in this particular example. We believe that this may be the a county, the first Spotsylvania County Courthouse. So when Spotswood left um, the, the lieutenant governorship, they organized a, a new county and they named it after him, Spotsylvania County named after Spotswood. They let him choose where the county seat would be located. He chose, oh, right next door to my house, Germana. 
So he was given 500 pounds to build a, uh, a courthouse, a church, and then a, several other sort of municipal structures that needed to go along with a, with a county seat. Um, and there's just a little bit of a timeline of sort of how that county structure started to develop and, and government sort of was added to the Piedmont area, moving away from sort of that frontier fort culture to a, a organized culture. Uh, oof. Apologize, let me get a little What I want to talk about here just briefly is um, this community <clears throat> was part of a path of westward expansion. Many peoples who were moving into the Piedmont, moving west, moving over the mountains, down the valley, came, made their way past Germana at that point. Um, there's another example. This is LIDAR data that gives us an idea of what the ground surface looks like below the tree, leaves, and canopy. And note, there's this little cut here. That's a roadway that's been there for a long time that many, many travelers have made their way to cross the Rapidan at a, fer at a ferry crossing, or it was called Germana Ford. It was a natural crossing as well. Many, many people moving west use this road. All right, so we had a story of Alexander Spotswood as a colonial governor Looking at Germana, we're also talking about Alexander as, as a Virginia frontiersman. Now, I apologize. Maybe you've kind of gotten the idea that I can be a little bit cheeky. Uh, I apologize for this, but I kind of like to put this juxtaposition of, you know, Alexander Spotswood as a coonskin cap wearing frontiersman. For those of you who are aghast at this, I did take this, this uh, coonskin cap from a picture of, of Benjamin Franklin, who was appointed... Um, Postmaster General after Spotswood, you know, d d left that position himself. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't mean any disrespect, but I just wanted sort of us to think about Spotswood in a little bit of a different light. Uh, with that, I think I'm going to say thank you and open up for, for questions, if I can. Yes, thank you very much. It's a of the early American history and would like to support free programs like this, please consider making a donation to the American Frontier Culture Foundation at frontierculturefoundation.org. Thank you for your support, and we hope to see you in person at the Frontier Culture Museum in Stanton, Virginia. <laughs>